Hello, and welcome to the TIFF podcast, where we explore the world of public health, interviewing registrars, academics, and leaders in the profession. My name is Kazim Bibijan, and I'm a specialty registrar in public health in the UK. The aim of this podcast is to offer a wide panoramic of what it means to work in public health, while hopefully providing some inspiration to those who would like to train in the profession. Hi everyone and um, welcome to our session and it's a very special episode of the TIFF podcast which many of you may know of if you don't know of it's called the Training in Public Health podcast. It's been running for about eight years or so now. It was started by a registrar in the West Midlands and continued by a number of registrars across across the UK. The main aim of the podcast really is to provide a wide panoramic of what it means to work in public health as we all do and we do this through interviewing registrars academics and a number of leaders in public health for example we recently interviewed professor martin mckee uh, about his career and the nhs and the doctor strikes we also interviewed the faculty's own professor kevin fenton about leadership skills um, how he communicates his media style uh, and the way he approaches um, his own continued professional development but today we have a, a very special episode of the podcast where we'll delve further into public health careers. So as registrars, we come from a huge range of backgrounds from, you know, SD1s joining this year, you may have come into the program with very little experience in public health, and you've got a huge world to explore. But other people may have come in with very established careers before public health and built up expertise, whether it's academia or local authority or health protection. But as a sort of cohort, we kind of go through the training where we're daunted with this question of, where do I want to go after I finish training? What's interesting to me? Do I want to go back to my expertise pre-training? Do I want to go into something completely new? Uh, and these can be quite you know, anxious questions. So these are the sort of topics that we're trying to discuss further in our panel. So we want to make it as interactive as possible. So if people have questions, please make sure you use the, the link. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to do a Q&A uh, with the audience in, in the room and online. So I'll introduce to my co-host, Fatai. Everyone probably already knows Fatai. Recently CCT'd registrar, former SRC chair. Fatai, over to you to introduce our panels. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it is really a pleasure to welcome our panelists for today and to be part of um, TIFF, a podcast that I've listened to so many times myself. So I will do the introduction of our panelists and I will start with you, Amina. Um, so Amina Esome is... Your first career was in academic public health, and you was a consultant in international public health at the then Public Health England. And since 2016, you've worked independently as an executive and as career coach to doctors and global leaders. Um, you hold MRCP as well as an MSc in public, public health from LSHTM and a PhD that was supervised by um, Sir Michael Mahmoud. Um, I understand that you're also an honorary lecturer at UCL teaching on social determinants of global health and wrote an award-winning book called The Success Trap, Why Good People Stay in Jobs They Don't Like and How to Break Free. <laughs> it's an incredible resume of achievement. <laughs> a warm welcome to you, Amina. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. And our next panelist is Ahmed Rasavi. Ahmed is a consultant in global health and the regional lead for Southeast Asia for UK Health Security Agency, working on international health regulation strengthening project. Ahmed is a medical, medical doctor by background and previously worked in across Africa, and it's omitted here that you were the Africa, African lead for UK Health Security Agency, but you've also worked across Europe, Southeast Asia, and the Caribbean, working particularly on global health issues, ranging from mental health to infectious diseases, with organizations such as the WHO, Chatham House, University of Cambridge, Public of England, UK Faculty of Public Health, Imperial College, Look, you get where I'm going. Incredible, <laughs> incredible CV. Welcome to you, Ahmed. Thanks very much for that. Thank you. And our last panelist, by far not the least, is Navid Said. Navid is a consultant in communicable disease control at UK HSA with over 25 years of experience in public health, medical education, and health protection. You've worked as a training program director in the West Midlands and as a CPD director for the, pub, uh, for the Faculty of Public Health. Um, Nabid also has worked as the first secretary for health at the British High Commission in Islamabad, Islamabad 
supporting the development of integrated disease surveillance and response systems. And you've also an accredited healthcare mentor and honorary senior lecturer at Birmingham University and one of my CCDCs when I was training <laughs> in West Midlands. A warm welcome to you, Naveen. <laughs> Fantastic. I think you will all agree that we've got an incredible panelist and with huge amount of experience that we can all learn from today. And, and as Kazim said in this intro, there are so many questions that go through our mind as we go through the, the registrar training. And one of the most stressful questions can be deciding the direction of career that we want to take. As we go through training, we are exposed to a number of different elements of public health, a broad range disciplines. And essentially we're trained to be a generalist specialist, which comes with that challenge. So it is useful to get a taste of the breadth of public health, but can then leave one really anxious and confused as to what comes next for your consultant job. So perhaps if we start with you, um, Naveed, as a um, communicable disease consultant, why did you choose a career in health protections? And what kind of registrar do you think that suits in terms of professional life? I'm not sure there's a, a specific route for it. So, uh, I mean, I, I was very privileged. I mean, the, one thing I would say is that being on the registrar scheme is a tremendous privilege. Right? And we don't always recognize how much of a privilege it is. When you look at other professions and their training, the, 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 the ability to do what we do in the protected environment is an incredible privilege. And we should recognize that and make the most of that. But for me, myself, in terms of health protection, it was mainly because of a lot of my trainers were health protection trainers. But obviously, coming from a clinical background, the thing that appealed to me was that it was quasi clinical. So I could still feel a doctor because I'm bringing that skill set in terms of being a diagnostician. We just change it into making risk assessments and, and doing an action plan. But essentially, it's the same process of, of diagnosing things. So I felt comfortable with that. And that felt like home, just changing the language a bit. That was my sort of journey. And, and the fact that it was quasi clinical again allowed me to use my background knowledge. And the, the, other, the other advantage that that clinical background gives you is medical diplomacy and health protection. You're able to navigate with other colleagues in the clinical setting in terms of being to, able to explain to them with currency that, you know, that this is what your advice should be. So, Ahmed, I just wonder if we can come to you in terms of your experience, because you've had over three years now working in post-CCT, working in global. We worked together during that time in global public health. Was that always the career that you wanted to go into? And at which point in training, if it wasn't, did you realise that that was the path for you? Sure. Um, that's a really good question, because I think when you come into training as an ST1, I can speak for myself, where... Quite honestly, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, I had just done my F1 and F2 and I came directly into public health. Didn't really understand what public health was about, what sort of skills I'd need to do it. I knew what public health was as a concept and I knew that I wanted to do something at the population health level. But actually, after having a couple of years in public health, that's when I started developing taste for something aspects of public health that are, for example, within global health as well. Um, I was an academic trainee, so I did some work in the Caribbean, which was on NCDs. And that, I think, opened the door to global health for me. I think global health is one of those catch-22s. You can't do it without the experience, but how do you get the experience in the first place? So global health was definitely in my mind, but I didn't anticipate getting into it quite so soon. I did think that I would build up my experience as a consultant in the UK before going into global health. And I think that is still the most common route for people in global health. I think a confluence of factors happened for me. I CCT'd around the same time as COVID hit. Um, and that meant that there were lots of gaps in the system. And I'd also spent 12 months in the global health placement at UKHSA. So I, I was trusted and I was relied upon to be able to do a good job. So then I kind of just fell into it more than anything else. And I think that's one of the messages that I would say to all registrars. 
however much you want to plan the end of your training and however much you want to line up a job, sometimes it is just the availability of a job. And what's most important is to use that to develop your skills and do things that are interesting within the portfolio that you have, um, and then look to further consultant jobs to develop your careers further. Thank you. And we've certainly had lots of discussion when I was going through my decision-making process. And it's worth remembering that first consultant job isn't your final job. And I think a lot of us approach it as if it's the definitive job that defines the rest of our career. So really, really helpful to hear some of your insights. And perhaps, Navid, if I, can, if I may come back to you, uh, the question I was sort of posing to you is, if while you were going through training, yeah. did you at any point thought maybe not health protection, maybe something else? And perhaps the key question there is, if there are um, registrars here who are not sure whether it's health protection or not, and they yeah. may be more inclined for health protection, but just doubting whether that's the right direction, what advice would you give them? I mean, it's essentially knowing your own strengths, you know, and, and, and knowing what you feel comfortable with. Um, and, and like I said, the, the, the training screen scheme allows us to dabble with lots of other things. And, and, and then you can experience things in, in, in a protected environment and find out, can I be doing this for the next five or 10 years? Not necessarily the next 20, 30 years, but can, can I you know, uh, uh, gather expertise in, in, in this area? And, and a lot of people who come into sort of you know, uh, uh, public health, um, when you pick up a new area or, or new thing to do, you're doing a, a health needs assessment, you, you dive straight into it, you get excited by it, uh, and, and that's good. And, and, and it's, it's about taking the things that excite you about a particular aspect of work and, and recognising those things and, and not getting put off by some of the mundane stuff. So it, it's recognising the things which are, thankfully, I'm, I'm very privileged that, I, you know, every day in the last 25 years, I've wanted to come into work. And I know it doesn't happen for everyone, uh, but I enjoy my work. So it, it, it's having things which excite you about coming into work that motivate you. And, and that's the key thing, finding those things which click with you. And, and there's no easy roadmap. And it, it is about using those four or five years to experience various things and like for me at med school, it was crossing off the things I knew I didn't want to do, right? Yeah. And then you have a shorter list and then you can sort of explore those things. Similar with, 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 with public, I thought there were th certain things once I've done, I'm not going to be good at this or I, I don't like that. So I've put that to the side. I've got the experience. I've signed off the portfolio, but I'll, I'll focus on other things which, which excite me more. So really, I completely agree about the excitement being a factor that you bear in mind when you come to that junction of where do I go? I mean, you, you've written about this extensively, you know, in your book and also from your own experience of changing career at some point. What, what would you say are the sort of main things that registrars should bear in mind when they come to that junction of, I've experienced all these things, but how do I decide which, which road to go down? Mm, that's a great question. And um, I think if you're feeling stuck, it's probably because you're focusing a bit too much on that thing. So although your instinct will try to get you to zoom more on it and ask lots of people and try and do lots of research and think about it a lot, um, the more helpful thing might be to zoom out and look wider. There might be an opportunity there waiting for you that you're not seeing. And it does require a bit of a shift in mindset. Some people call it mindset. It's the way you sort of approach life, the way you sort of show up every day. I think the... A development that can happen. Did anybody study psychology? Very few, few people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you remember studying about child development? But did you study adult development? Yep. It's one, no, it's one of the sort of it seems like a secret somehow. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but we continue developing. And so if you're wondering like what, what am I supposed to be doing with my time, think about how do I want to develop? There's a psychologist at Harvard called Robert Ke Keegan who, who came up with this framework. If you go from the socialized mind of I'm trying to fit in, I'm trying to show, I'm trying to prove myself that I can do things, uh, you know, that I fit in with the culture. Then you go to self-authoring, which is you start to look at what you care about. What is it that matters to you, even if it doesn't matter to you know, the organization you're in or the profession you're in. And then from there, you go to self-transforming. But it essentially just means that you're able to tolerate ambiguity more. You're able to deal with uncertainty more. And so these career junctures 
are filled with uncertainty and complexity. You know, if you want to apply a social determinants of health approach, you're kind of saying there are lots of different factors affecting my path. So my one tip would be if you're feeling a bit stuck, then try and zoom out and then see what you need to do to be more okay with the uncertainty. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So we just have that, that pause mm. to, to broadly look at what's what's actually important to you at that point. But, but I guess we're bringing it on about global health. I think both of you, well, all three of you have had some experience in global health in that sense. Do you think there's more of a consideration of the sort of personal aspect? Because obviously there's a lot of travel. You've, you've worked in the previous PHE International Health Department. How, how much of a factor do, and, and is sort of the personal aspect to what do you want your job to look like? You know, mm. do I want to be potentially working weekends and evenings, that kind of thing? Mm. Is, is there a sort of framework or thing, uh, you know, way that you can think of how much should I balance my personal life? How much should I balance my career aspirations? How much should I balance, uh, you know, subject matter or that kind of thing? Mm. Well, just asking the question is, you know, you've already won because... Uh, most people are sort of going from one thing to the next and think, I don't even have time to to, 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 to brush my teeth. What do you want me to think about? <laughs> yeah. How, you know? So just taking the time to pause and think, what's important to me right now in my life? Even if when I started out, it was all about work and conquering the world and saving the planet. Now, actually, I just want to do some gardening and spend time <laughs> with my children or with my uncle. Or I don't know. Taking that time is really important. Those are your social determinants of your career path. And don't let anybody else tell you what's important. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I still vividly remember as, as, as a sort of uh, SPR1, as we were in those days, just having a conversation with some of the other trainees. And, and then my supervisor asked me to do something. And I said, yeah, fine, I'll, I'll read it tonight and I'll bring it in tomorrow. And then we'll, we'll have a chat about it. And, and I didn't think anything of it. And you know, coming from a, a sort of medical background, you're expected to do work in the evenings and do your studying and all that sort of stuff. So for me, that was natural. And then so the meeting finished. And then, and then sort of uh, Viv, she was a fourth year registrar. She came up to me and said, don't you dare take that work home. <laughs> and I said, whoa. And she goes, you know, you're you're paid to work nine to five, and you you should do the work in your allotted hours. You're not supposed to take it home, and for me that was a step change, and I I, I you know uh, I still remember it. I mean I I haven't gone along with that philosophy you know all the way <laughs> there are times when you do need to burn the midnight oil just to make sure the things are right, but yeah. as a as an approach, you you you're not there living to yeah. work uh, and for me that was a really instructive piece of advice from a senior trainee to say put things in perspective yeah. you have a life that sort of nuance between do you live to work or do you work to live that kind of thing mm -hmm. um yes yeah, so i guess setting your core values of you know you may slip up and work evenings that kind of thing but what do you want your life to really look like when it comes to that um so we've, we've talked a little bit about career direction and at that junction but i guess one of the most anxious periods for sort of st4s and st5s is that transition to your consultant role, right? Wherever you picked it to go into that, because you're essentially transitioning to a sort of lead public health leader in the making. I mean, registrars are also public health leaders in the making, but as a consultant, you're on senior leadership teams, you're making quite big decisions. Ahmed, you know, people may not know, but Ahmed, you've only CCT in the last what, four years or so, and you've come into a relatively senior leadership position. What was that process like for you from registrar to consultant? Was it quite smooth I know you you know as you said you were in global health before you went to that position what did you find sort of challenging in that in that transition the transition phase can be so difficult for a lot of people I was very fortunate in my transition phase to have the person who supervised me effectively sponsoring me to apply to that position and she trusted me in my approach and in my abilities so when I stepped up to that role it meant that she already knew that I could do the job and therefore I felt empowered that yes I am capable she trusts me she's very capable so there must be something about me that she's seen that she thinks I'm worth trying essentially but that step up to a consultant role is not easy um, so I went from very project-based doing discrete project work mostly just technical stuff to becoming suddenly leading a team which ended up being about 80 people in various different uh, roles beneath me so I was directly managing about six or seven of them and then each of those teams had um, up to 80 people so it was a huge change from where I came from and I don't think there was anything that really prepared me for that one thing I would say to all registrars is 
definitely try and get some line management experience, definitely try and get some budget management experience. It's really difficult to do in training. I know, I know it is because I've been there and I didn't manage to get it, but it is such a bonus when you already know how to manage a budget or manage a team and you can set a team culture when you come into that sort of role. For me, the way I went about it is I was already managing and line managing consultants who had 20 years as consultants. So I stepped directly into that role where I had three or four consultants who had been in the jobs for many, many years and been consultants for 20 years. And that was a really difficult transition because they knew I was just a new consultant and they knew that potentially they knew more than I did. But what you have to do is be humble. You have to have humility and understand the limits of your own expertise. And for me, what I was was an enabler for them. So I knew how to unpick the lock in the governance within UK HSA. So I became an enabler for them to manage that and navigate that because they are based in the different countries around the world that they're based. So it's having your own approach to line management, to setting a team culture. And, And on team culture, I would add that it was really important for me at the outset to set out my values, that this is how I'm going to approach the team dynamics in the it, it, amongst our team so it was very important for me to have quite a flat structure where everyone could come to me directly if they wanted to not to subvert line management but just to be able to have a conversation and say oh we don't think this bit is going wrong you know uh, this bit is going right so actually could we do something about this having that open door meant that people could come to me and I would actually listen to them that's the other part listen to your team there's a massive amount of expertise in allied health professionals that work with us as public health consultants or registrars and listening to their expertise, listening to their experience and then benefiting from that and then setting the strategy accordingly was very important. So would you say that that sort of leadership and management was sort of a a little bit of a hole in the, in the training program in that sense? I mean, we really only have Mm -hmm. one or two learning outcomes around line management and that kind of thing. So your tip would be to registrars to try and reach out to, to Mm -hmm. get that experience a bit more before that transition. Absolutely. Try and get that experience. I appreciate it's really hard to do, but talk to your supervisors about any ways that you might be able to do that. Talk to your TPDs to create opportunities to do that as well. Yeah. Um, and your very leading question on whether there's a hole <laughs> on leadership and management. Um, I think there is a hole. Yes. I'm not sure what you do about addressing it. Because the, a registrar on a placement for six months cannot really have budgetary responsibility for an entire council. It's yeah. really difficult to do that. So just learn from others. If you have supervisors who manage budgets, go into meetings with them. It may be boring. You may not enjoy the project management aspects of it, but actually just learn from them because that will really help you ease into that consultant role. Yeah. Yeah, thinking about it now, I probably don't want to add additional learning outcomes on that. No more learning outcomes. Um, uh, I, I just quickly yeah, add on that. Um, also, look outside the training scheme. Don't rely on the training scheme to make you into the person you want to be. So, you know, the classic example is uh, be the treasurer of your local um, sports club. Um, but it can be more exciting. You, know, you can do a podcast and have a team and you can do all sorts of things outside the training scheme. You need some boundaries because obviously you know, uh, for obvious reasons. So, um, but there is a world outside and um, maybe another recommendation would be expand your horizons beyond (laughs) the career you're in because uh, one of the things I learned from my journey as a doctor and then a public health uh, um, professional was that uh, it's easy to think that that's the only thing in the world and there are no other worthy jobs or no work or anything outside. So just to remember there is. Navid, I know you've you've done a lot of sort of mentoring of uh, registrars as well. Is there anything that you've learned from you know that registrar to consultant transition of coaching people through that? What what would you be your sort of top tips for, yeah, for that transition? Top tips. I mean, what, what one of the things I wish I'd done as a trainee would be more observant. So even though you don't get the chance to have those leadership roles, is recognize that there are people who are in those leadership roles and and see who is a good leader and who is a bad leader, who conducts a good meeting, who conducts a bad meeting. Not just observe it, but make notes about it and then discuss it with your ES because then you're formulating a language around leadership and and, and, and uh, chairing meetings and taking things forward. That gets you to think like that. Most of the training assumes you're going to pick it up by osmosis and then suddenly, you know, you flip into the uh, finished product and it's not like that and and the earlier you can start that 
sort of uh, that dialogue and learning the language of leadership, the more you can then develop your own style and recognize your own style. And you take from others good bits of their leadership and you know, more importantly, what not to do in certain uh, circumstances when you see other people really crash and burn. In, in meetings so you, you and, and 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 having that and and having your own little red book or black book where you make those notes and you start to develop into who you are because when you finish you're an expert you are a finished product because you've got the badge you've got the letters after your name and the rest of the world will see you as the finished product you will have imposter syndrome i still have imposter syndrome right and, and and most of us are self-selected group into public health training. You know what I mean in terms of the characteristics of what we bring in, right? So we we live with that, and, and it's a, it's how how do you manage to negotiate with yourself that you're not an imposter, and that you've gone through this training, you've gone through all this experience, and you validate all of that into who you are, and like you said you will continuously learn. You know, it's not just jumping the hoops of CPD and revalidation. It is about self-improvement and being a better person than you were last month, last year. And, and, and that's, that, that, that's the journey that we should be on. The end point is not CCT. The end point is 20 years into your career where you can look back and say, yeah, I think I've made a difference. Thank you. I mean, that's incredible when... I look at someone like you that I've admired for so many years. Talk about having imposter syndrome. <laughs> I mean, a lot of registrars will recognize some of that. We were hoping it stops at a certain point. <laughs> but it, sounds like, it sounds like it doesn't. And we just need to think about how we manage that. And perhaps if I may come to you, Amina, on that. And just thinking in your in your book, The, the, the Success Trap, you, you talked about turning uncertainty into opportunity. And, and if you perhaps can just elaborate a little bit more on what you meant by that and how as a registrar going into consultant life how we can capitalize in transforming that uncertainty into opportunity mm, that's a tough one <laughs> <laughs> broaden your horizons the whole world is going through massive uncertainty right now so it's not about you right you're there's nothing wrong with you if you're feeling uncertain or afraid or you have no idea what to do next so that's the first thing, because once we accept where we are, it's easier to then find the next step. So the first tip would be just accept the feeling of imposter, the feeling of uncertainty and embrace it. Perhaps building on mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. is that something you recognize as well then as having imposter syndrome? And how do you manage that? How do you do right, that? Yeah. Is there any coping mechanism, any coping strategy that you utilize yes. or you've heard other use that we can plagiarize with pride <laughs> self-awareness number one community number two and having a practice of some kind how do you sit with all of this in yourself uh it's easy to just run around and keep doing things and hope the answer is going to appear but the truth is everybody is uh, dealing with what are universal issues like what am i supposed to do with my life universal question um so it's a chance actually to become even more comfortable actually uh, with where you are, who you are as a human, connect with others and have really meaningful conversations about either what you want to do or what do we do together to address issue X. And uh, maybe from the book, a shift uh, along the line of the adult development path I was talking about is to go from an employee expert mindset to an entrepreneur leader mindset. So if you want to put that in your learning outcomes, feel free. You can cite me if you want. <laughs> um, but the employee expert is like the conforming and have all the answers. Not having the answers is bad, right? Um, entrepreneur leader is like, nobody knows anything. So what's your idea? What do you think we should do? Let's talk about it. And then let's try something. Let's experiment and see how it goes and celebrate along the way, mourn the losses. And then when the next point comes, try something different. Uh, so play the long game and know when to pivot with this entrepreneur leader mindset. Does that answer? Yeah, it does. And you're giving me some of my key tools I'm going to have in my, in my tool set. You've talked about self-transforming, being okay with uncertainty. I've now got employee experts, so I'm, I'm certainly making notes. And, and Armin, you talked about 
on picking the governor's luck. And, and perhaps if I may come to you in terms of when we talk about leadership skills that you need as a consultant, and, and once you are in that space, you also talk about humility. It, it sounds like there's a lot of non-technical skills that we really need to think about how we cultivate. Can I just get your reflection on some of that leadership skills? And you've alluded to some of them, but yeah, can you just elaborate a little bit more about some of those leadership skills? Sure. So I think the biggest change I see in myself since the day I CCT to now is in terms of how I would manage and lead in situations. And that's been the biggest development. I think my technical skills are probably the same as they were, um, but that's really been where I've really developed a lot. And and it's a constant lifelong journey, as you've heard from, from our colleagues. And you, you're probably surprised by hearing us up here talk about imposter syndrome. But actually, if you talk to even higher up people, they will all have imposter syndrome. They will all think to themselves, wait a second, how can I speak in front of, say, for example, I'm talking to one of my team who's a lab specialist. I have no clue what goes on in the lab. I mean, you know, beakers, Bunsen burners, that sort of thing. I don't know anything more than that. So how am I supposed to advise that person on what they're going to do? It's a really tricky question. So it comes back to humility. It comes back to recognizing the strengths and the expertise within your team and those people around you, and then taking advantage of that, essentially, but actually being a guide for that as well. And then you talked about unpicking the lock for Ty. I think that's also a really key consultant skill. Consultancy isn't the end game. You're not at the top of the food chain as you, as you become a consultant. There'll always be people above you who you also have to upwards line manage, essentially, and upwards influence. And influencing and negotiating are two of again, probably the key skills that I feel like I've developed, but still have a lot more room to grow in, in terms of my consultant journey, because without that influencing and negotiating, you may be stuck with a set of circumstances that you don't really think work for you um, or work for the type of work that you're doing. And what you really need to be able to do is persuade your line manager into a different way of thinking or persuade the person that sets strategy in your organization to a different way of thinking. So being able to have that quiet leadership in the background where you don't take credit for the idea, you don't take credit for the difference that's been made, but actually you've just had a conversation with this person and then you've spoken to that senior person and you said, oh, what about this idea? Wouldn't it be great if we did this? That sort of conversation is really invaluable in, in, uh, in my experience as being a consultant. Fantastic. And we've had many of those conversations and you've gone on to have conversation with other people that's helped connect the dots so I can sort of relate to that. And perhaps one final question from me, if I may direct this to, to Naveed, and this is me really exposing my imposter syndrome here, and I feel like you've given me the authority to, to do that. Because Naveed, we hear a lot around system leadership. Yeah. And is it okay if I say, I don't know what we're talking about when we say that. <laughs> so could you please just elaborate? When we talk about training and becoming senior leaders and be system leaders, what do we mean? I mean, it's part of what, what, what Afton mentioned, j just in terms of joining the dots and, and, and connecting. But I mean, one thing I struggled with as, as a trainee and as a, as a, as a young, young sort of uh, consultant was uh, leadership for health. Well, what does that mean? And it took me years to work out what uh, my understanding of it anyway. It's probably still wrong if I you know, express it out loud. But it's basically, you know, uh, being motivated by... The, the the health outcome in in all your conversations so everything that you do all your interactions uh all, all these side discussions all these nudging that it, it's all underpinned with your philosophy of putting a, a better health for everyone the key to everything you don't need to express it all the time but that's your motivation so you're you're using your motivation for advocacy of, uh, of the marginalized people for, for 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 talking about inequalities for making health better or better quality of life you're you're pushing those things and, and that is the the thing that is motivating you to make the change so it doesn't matter how those changes get done so long as it's going in that direction and, and your engagement should be purposeful for that you don't know, you have the intention to do things, you don't know the outcome, you know, in a year or five years time. But if your intention was to nudge in that direction, and it's purposeful, then that is moving the, the conversation in the right direction. And, and you'll never know whether your contribution to the, the, the final 
health outcome, the, the betterment in the health outcome was 5% or 50%, but it doesn't matter. It's better than it was before. And, and, and that's what gives me the sense of satisfaction that I've done a day's work. No, that's really, that's really helpful. And it's, it's the word that I'm picking up from what you've just said is that being purposeful. So yeah. we are uniquely placed in a, in, in public health system, actually, that we have a number of interactions and we mm. have a number of conversation is how do we be purposeful that those conversations is driving forward yeah. the health outcome for the population that we are serving. See, now that you explain it that way, I understand <laughs> what that is, but that, thank you. Yeah, we're coming towards the end of the, the session. So if you could start putting your questions in the chat that we'll get to and think of your questions um, in the room. I think there were probably some mics roaming around. Yeah, Tom will come around with the mics. Just raise your hands if you have any questions. Maybe I'll start with one around networking. So I had a really interesting conversation with the registrar and they said to me, I'm not very good at networking. I'm, I'm a bit socially awkward and I don't really know how to speak to someone I don't know. Um, but it feels like from from you all that you know you you probably have mentors in the background that keep you engaged in these types of conversations about how you do, you decide what your career direction. I'll start with Ahmed. Like, how would what advice would you give to a socially awkward registrar who doesn't know how to network? <laughs> I'm one. I, I know you targeted that question. So <laughs> from from university. So we did undergraduate together. Um, so he knows that I am that socially, socially awkward registrar and he has seen me become what I am now. So that's why he's targeted that question as me. And, and, and it's a really important question because I'm an introvert. There's no, I'd make no apologies for that. I would rather be by myself in most scenarios. I'll, I'll you know, books, movies, whatever. I love social interaction, but it tires me out. Okay. So I know what my social battery is. So when I come to events like this, I won't, for example, if there was a formal dinner after this, I'm not going to turn up to the formal dinner because by that time I'll be drained and I'll just be useless company. <laughs> so I will focus on really delivering within the social battery that I have and interacting with people during that time. It's also really helpful to have experience of events like this. You've been having lunch with one another. You've been speaking with one another. You've gotten to know new people. You've gotten to know different people. The more you're comfortable with that sort of thing as an introvert, the more you're going to be able to do that networking bit, you're, the more you're going to be able to uh, engage with other people. And then the other thing is always ask questions. There's something you can learn off everyone. If you ask them questions, that's an opening door for you to have a conversation with them, for you to learn with them, and potentially for, you, for them to feel like, oh, yes, this person is actually interested in what I think. So it, it, it helps you link up together as well. And quite honestly, it's just time and, and experience. Yeah. Thanks, uh, questions for me? Hajar. Thanks, Kazim. Hajar and ST5 in London. I think it's just on that point, the transactional networking to what Amina was talking about, building a community. How do you do that? It does, networking does feel like it's quite transactional. Mm -hmm. And any advice, probably, Amina, you spoke earlier about building a community. What did you mean by that? If you can just expand on that. Great question. So an alternative to networking is net caring. So just shifts the attitude, right? So instead of like trying to figure out who I need to talk to to get my next job, then I'm just going to see like, who am I drawn to and how can I help them? Or how can I ask interested questions rather than interesting questions that make me look good? Um, and then also having an intention when you come in. So if you want to build community, what does that mean for you? What does that look like? You speak to one person, that's enough for today or five. And can I just add to that? I love that, net caring, because actually when you're interested in people and their personal lives, that helps you build a connection. And it has to be true, of course. You can't, you have to be genuine about it. Um, but actually when you're interested in all of your staff or all of your colleagues, then that makes a huge difference in terms of network. And then shared values as well. So for example, especially within global health, there's a lot of issues around diversity and inclusion. There's issues around decolonizing global health. So I work a lot on that and people who are interested in that topic, we have a community. We all know each other. We can work together and, and you know, that's your network as well or net care. Mm -hmm. As someone who is more introverted than Ahmed, <laughs> um, uh, what, I, I, what I do is I observe people who are good at it, you know, and, and I'll see what they're, they are doing that, you know, what skills can I learn from them? And I've gone up to them afterwards and said, look, you're really good at what you do. Can I just 
hang around you at the next meeting just just to be sort of a, a closer to them as they're doing their their, their their sort of networking and then you sort of stand in awe and go oh, wow you know uh, but you can pick up things in terms of how to do it slightly better and improve yourself and you'll never get to that stage but I'm comfortable with that and I'll, I'll do it in my own way but it, it's just knowing who's good at it and then sort of because you know, they do it naturally you know uh, and and then just seeing if you can tag along uh, and then maybe after a while you'll you know you'll you'll get a bit better at it Seb thank you uh, I'm Seb I'm an ST4 in East England uh, and I'm at a program I'm doing a PhD and I've been thinking about what I would do beyond that so I've got half a PhD left and then do I want to go into academia service somewhere in the interface and one of the things a lot of people say is that the job you probably want doesn't may might not even exist yet, especially that interface role has changed all the time. But then I'm always reminded of the career advisor we had when we were uh, medics and in F2. And he said, I know too many people who are now unhappy with the careers they're in because they didn't spend enough time trying to plan for it. And so I feel it's like sort of pull in both directions. One is kind of like be free and easy. Like Ahmed said, like you don't know what you want to do and it'll just kind of come and just kind of go along with the ride. But then also that, that needs to be a bit strategic. And I just wonder if you could reflect on how you balance, if if you think that split is correct and how, how you kind of managed it and found the balance between planning and being strategic, but also recognizing that, you know, you, you can't plan everything and opportunities will change. And Yeah, so I think <laughs> the answer is, is the balance. Um, but again, remember I said, spend time knowing what's important to you because then that's your compass you might not have all the opportunities in front of you but when it shows up you know whether it's a yes or a no you're not gonna go into it and anything so i would say being strategic means knowing your values knowing your beliefs uh, maybe having a vision like for example can i give a, we have time for a quick example yeah, yeah. um so at the end of my training i was told it's local authority uh that's where it's at and I was like, yeah, but I left my country because of civil war and kind of got a global outlook on things. And, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was in a real conundrum uh, for a while. And um, I just kind of knew what wasn't right. And, um, and then one day I walk into a lift and meet the person who was going to become my next boss. Totally random. But she said, who are you? And I said, I'm so-and-so. She said, I work on global health. I'm like, oh, <laughs> uh, I could have just said, oh, that's nice. But I felt, oh, right, because I knew what was important to me. And then there was a dilemma of like, yeah, but there are no jobs in global health. So what's the point of going and doing that as my final placement? Uh, so then that was another period. And then it was when I was in the middle of nowhere uh, in nature that suddenly it occurred to me, of course, that's what I'm going to do, because I was free of these external influences. So you see, it's not like, uh, you know, I planned it, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to right? Um, but I knew what was important to me and I was prepared to take a risk. Again, that's the uncertainty. So I, I know it's not like a formula, but... So that's uh, a moment of serendipity almost. Yeah. yeah. Armit, did you want to... Yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Sam. Um, because the uncertainty is there. It's, it's, it's really difficult to be able to scope out exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is a case of, making the most out of the opportunities you do have. Um, so for example, uh, I know a local authority consultant who really wanted to work in global health, but didn't find the right opportunity for him to be able to do so. But actually he's become really interested in migrant health um, as part of his local authority work. And he's, that migrant health work is really fulfilling that itch that he had in terms of doing global health. And that that's what he wanted to do. And in terms of lining yourself up for that, I would say, like, like um, my colleagues have said, you know, there's certain things that you won't want to do, but keep your options open outside of that um, and keep your networks there as well. So keep in touch with the people that you like, uh, that you have worked with in the past, especially if you see someone and you're like, ah, oh, that's the consultant job I really want to do. Just keep in touch with them, you know, uh, ask for mentorship, potentially. Just have some sort of relationship there. And then hopefully when there is an opportunity, you can take it. So, yeah. yeah. Good to see you again. So, uh, <laughs> Networking. Uh, it, it is. I mean, it's. It, I, I think what under sort of underpinned your question was the wrong premise because you shouldn't now think of a career for life, right? You 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 should think of developing your portfolio of skills, 
and in my generation, we thought of a career for life. We go in one thing and we stick to that. And, and, and that was expected. But amongst yourselves, I think that's the wrong attitude. And I don't think the workforce is like that. So you should be thinking about developing a portfolio of different skills that you can uh, gather in different settings to improve yourself. And then it will come with time in terms of where you want to really then bed down. That's what I would say. And maybe just briefly, the Ikigai tool. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, a Japanese concept called Ikigai. Maybe some of you have heard of it. It's the sweet spot of what you're, uh, what you're passionate about, what you are um, very good at, what's your zone of genius, or you know, very, very good at it, what the world needs and what the world will pay you for if you want it to, to be a job. Um, so if you want to strategize, keep track of that and scan the, you know, the environment for what fits and see if it matches. What you uh, we'll take a question from online. So I think I'll, I'll probably sum up the question, but um, essentially it's the idea of how do you balance, you know, managing the demands of training, being on the registrar training program can often be a bit of a hamster wheel of chasing learning outcomes and trying to get through your placement and reflect and reflect and reflect. Um, but <laughs> how do you balance the training program with developing ourselves professionally with our interests and planning our careers in that sense? Maybe I'll go to uh, Ahmed first. Sure. So I think this is a, a question that where you have to remind yourself what is the purpose of the training program. And the purpose of the training program is to develop you as people to be the next generation of um, public health consultants and the public health expertise across the UK. So if that's the purpose of the training program, anything that you want in terms of developing your leadership or management skills or budget or whatever it might be should be within the training program. And if you're finding that you're not getting that, I would say have a serious conversation with your educational supervisor, see if your TPD can create opportunities for it. Because that is the purpose of the training program. You're not service delivery. You're not meant to be plugging gaps. You're not meant to be doing whatever the consultant that day didn't fancy doing, so he gave to you. You are meant to be training yourselves and developing yourselves to become the next generation of public health consultants. So prioritize that. And of course, you have to do your learning outcomes. They're there for a reason. But actually, what I found, and I don't know if this is still possible, I found that within the first sort of three years or so, I ticked off most things. And then after that, I had a lot more flexibility to develop myself in the directions that I wanted to. So if you're early on in your um, registrar journey, please try and do that as well. Just, just, just to say, I mean, I agree with everything there, apart from one thing. Mm -hmm. I think the, the public health, the, the training scheme is is should be there to develop in, not into public health consultants, but into public health leaders. And that's the mindset. You you need to think of yourself and believe in yourself as being the next generation. So Kevin said it at the beginning of public health leaders. You know, it, it's it's a great investment in us as individuals because I've come through the scheme. Right. Uh, and, and it is to make us public health leaders so that we can imbue that sort of love of public health to other people that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So quick, bring... quick, tool, quick coaching tool. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> practical. So agree with everything as well that you both said. And an energy audit. Put a line down a piece of paper, what energizes you, what drains you. Uh, put, you can have a maybe. And then try and bring more of your attention and energy towards what energizes you. Because it's so easy, like you said, to just get on the hamster wheel yeah. and then just lose track of what actually you want to do. Um, and try and do less of what drains you. Yeah. Coming towards the end, I'll give a very short question to each of you. It's a tradition on the podcast to end on this question. What is your one very short career tip for those currently training in public health? It's a small family. Public health is a small family. You come across everyone, right? And you will keep coming across them. Treat them well. Treat them well. <laughs> right? Treat nice. them nicely. Okay? Yeah. All right. On one small career tip. Humility. Humility. Recognize others' expertise and value it. What Naveed and Ahmed said, and uh, serve, don't please. Again, grow, grow out of the instinct to do the right thing and think of what you're in service to. Fantastic. I, I, I don't think I've ever made so much notes here <laughs> in the session I'm supposed to be chairing. So incredible insights. Really, really thank you all for sharing some of that insight with me. I, I mean, some of the key stand out for me. And I think you added on that about the small family, the importance of just 
growing your network, and I don't necessarily mean a social network, but your sphere of influence, connecting with registrars, not just in your region, outside of the region. I think for me that there's something really important around that. Love the net, net caring, shifting from networking, mm-hmm. transactional to really getting to know people mm-hmm. and understanding some of that elements. And Ahmed, this, this unpicking tool is just keep coming back to me and just <laughs> thinking about the leadership. And, and, and I did you talk about this. It's not just training to be consultants, training to be leaders. And what does that mean? And what are the various tools and the importance of just being humble? that in the space, there will be others who knows a lot more than we do. And how do we lean on that? And how do we work together on that? Really, I mean, there's a lot more I can say on this. A really incredible set of insight. Thank you. It's been an incredible session. And a round of applause for our panelists. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you found it valuable, please leave us a review and follow us on Twitter for news and updates on future episodes.